All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we're at the November um, Woods and Austin Woods and Waters Club uh, virtual luncheon. And so we're going to allow some people to come into um, our broadcast here. So uh, for those waiting, we're a social club and uh, we like to talk about hunting and fishing. We meet once a month, whether it's virtually or in person. And so uh, while people are filing in, uh, Jimmy and I are going to talk a little hunting and fishing here to let the folks come in and, and before we get through some announcements and then get over to our guest speaker today, Captain uh, Sally Black from the Baffin Bay Rod and Gun uh, Lodge. So, Jimmy, it's prime time. It's right. hunting season. Yes, Most of our members are hunters. They fish yeah. only because it's hunting season's closed in summertime, and so it's hunting season now. So uh, you know, mm -hmm. let's talk talk a little duck hunting. You're a duck hunter. Well, I'm a duck hunter. I have to say, I just we just finished dove season on Sunday and had a actually a really great hunt up in Manor with uh, the Maha Loop Dove Hunting Society, which is Jack Wolf, Richard Lowe, Corey Gaskell, and Dave. Uh, 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 oh, excuse me, uh, Dave, Dave, uh, with the catfish house, um, Kerbo. Kerbo. And, uh, so there were I was shocked how many doves there were and it took a little coaxing to get them to move around, but we actually wound up with a, a really good hunt seeing it's a last day of the first split. So it was pretty surprising. It was, it was very windy, which really helps my shooting. Uh, but anyway, um, Dave was the high man for the afternoon, but we really had a nice day and it was beautiful and, and the doves were flying. So I couldn't have any problem with that. Love those stories. Love those stories. So what do you got planned for duck hunting season this coming year? It well, opens, on, it opens on Saturday. You season opened last yeah. week, but uh, regular season opens this Saturday. What do you got planned for duck well, season? Well, we're going we're gonna to do one of the club hunts. Uh, we're going to do the East Texas hunt in January, but we're taking the whole family. So mm -hmm. my wife, Nikki, has never duck hunted. Um, the two boys have been up there with me before. Um, and, and this is, you know, this is so different from what I'm used to in South Louisiana, you know, park your car by the barn and walk down the hill to the, the tank and then shoot ducks. I mean, that's just foreign, but it works. So uh, hopefully we'll get uh, get my wife in a good spot. She can get some birds. Uh, so we're going to do that. We're going to do a family hunt in January. Cool. So uh, Hannah destroyed a couple of my blind duck blinds down on the Upper Laguna Madre in Flower Bluff. And so um, I'm trying to kind of retool my duck hunting program this year. And Captain Sally and I were talking off camera here a little bit before we went live. And she gave me a couple of good ideas on what to do here. So I may have to do that. I also uh, uh, have a good friend of mine, a fraternity brother of mine that goes to the Pintail Lodge. That's out of Garwood, Texas. And man, that's fantastic hunting, kind of in that Eagle Lake area. And so uh, I hope to get there a time or two this year. And um, man, they've got all species there. I don't know a species that doesn't go there. Um, so that, that's a fantastic place. They've got excellent, excellent duck hunting there. So as far as uh, deer hunting goes, uh, I guess our friends in the club have uh, got the, all the feeders full and, and uh, you know, ready to head out at noon on Friday to the deer lease, huh? I don't know if you all read that article in the new game bag, but Kevin McConnell had quite an afternoon one day when a hog ran through his neighborhood. Take, check that out if you dare. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that. I have not read that. I got my game bag in front of me. We're going to refer to that here in a little bit. But yeah, so uh, anyway, uh, let's see. We've been on live for uh, about three or four minutes. Let's do one more story, then I'll jump into the announcements and get going. We also got quail and turkey season uh, coming up. Uh, or Yeah, I guess started. I think quail started uh, last weekend. Uh, hopefully I get to find a, a place to go do some quail hunting uh, this year. Um, and then uh, turkey season, of course, is most renowned for spring turkey hunting, but uh, you can certainly take some turkeys here in, in November and in, in December. I don't know the exact days for those, but um, perhaps somebody could look that up and put that in our, our, our feed there. I see Doug's on, Mary Ann's on. Uh, who else is on out there if you're 
listening to us, uh, please post a comment and we'll have some chat going through here today. Uh, and of course, if you've got a question at any point during Captain Sally's presentation here in a little bit, put it in the comments there. I'll be monitoring those comments and we'll be able to come on and uh, get your question in, in front of Captain Sally so she can answer that. And then uh, Captain Sally, she's not on our, our video now, but she's listening in. And so Captain Sally, uh, I may have to interrupt you from time to time during the broadcast for an appropriate and timely question for pursuing uh, uh, pertaining to your, your presentation here. So be prepared for that. Don't like to be rude, but our viewers need their questions answered, you know. So uh, anyway, welcome to our luncheon again. Uh, a few uh, announcements as we get going here. Um, as we transition out of 2020, finally here in the next couple of months, we'll transition into 2021. We have uh, our annual cycle of our uh, board uh, members. And so we're looking for a few board members. Marianne, I think, mentioned that certainly in an email and, and maybe in um, the, the game bag as well. If you're out there and you want to um, help us uh, help the club and would like to join on on the board, it's a three year commitment and uh, love to hear from you. Either put your name in, in the comments there. I'll reach back out to you or you can certainly um, uh, reach out to me directly at Spence at MA Texas on there. Uh, Marianne, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and put my email in that uh, chat, Spence at MA Texas, and you can reach out to me and we'll get you involved with the club. It's been very rewarding on my behalf. I've kind of been on the board 10 years ago, rotated out and got back on two or three years ago. And it's been uh, very, very rewarding getting to know some top quality folks uh, uh, in the club and, and enjoying some hunting and fishing along the way. So uh, I highly recommend it that uh, if you want to uh, meet some new people and expand your hunting and fishing uh, horizons, please uh, let me know and we'll get you involved with the board. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to do a quick screen share. And um, I want to show our corporate sponsors here. These were from our 29 banquet, and we'll continue to promote them and honor them uh, until we get uh, some new corporate sponsors. They uh, sign up to be a corporate sponsor of the 2019 banquet, uh, the McBride's Foundation banquet, which will be uh, usually at TDS, Texas Disposal Systems. So quickly, we want to thank. Plains Capital Bank, that's uh, Tommy Ward, Dynamic Systems, or mechanical contractors. Uh, we want to thank Per Sterling. We've got a couple members uh, who work for Per Sterling, their wealth management. That's Richard Hallam and Kim Bray. Uh, previously, I mentioned TDS, uh, what great, great folks they are for building a fine banquet facility, banquet hall out there to allow the charities of the Austin area to utilize to raise funds. Uh, Morgan Stanley, and we've got a couple of, uh, of members there. That's Rhett Stone and John Dayton. Thank you for your sponsorship. Independence Title, Colin Parker and Jennifer Goodrum. They've been with us a number of years. We thank them. Uh, we have Representative John Syria, House District 17. He won, um, he won his election last night, so he'll be back in the State House. Uh, congratulations, John. Hopefully you're listening today. I'm sure you're doing some post-campaign wrap-up, but in the event that you're listening, I know you were at the October 22nd fundraiser listening in. Congratulations, John. John was a chairman or is a chairman. He Things may change here, but uh, of the CRT, Cultural Resources and Tourism um, Committee in, in the Texas House. He's a good friend of conservation and a good friend of our club. Last but certainly not least, McBride's, where the hunt begins at 30th and North Lamar. Uh, fantastic folks to help the, the outdoor community here. So uh, speaking of, we had a fundraiser on October 22nd and uh, we raised some money both for the club and uh, through a live auction. I specifically want to thank Jack Nash for his generous contribution uh, donation of two South Texas whitetail management deer hunts. Uh, that went well, and that in and of itself is, helps our club uh, maintain a financial uh, stronghold this year. And then we also had a little uh, raffle, which benefited the McBride's Foundation on there. Uh, we were able to raise about 5000 bucks for the foundation and then uh, probably about nine or 10000 for 
for the club on there uh, at that October 22nd event uh, online. Uh, Doug Dubois, uh, who runs the, is the head honcho for the McBride's Foundation trustees, announced our um, grant recipients. Uh, we gave out $27,000 to these folks that you see here. I'm going to try to zoom in and make that a little bit bigger. And so um, a lot of them have been with us before. Uh, Explore Austin right there is a new organization that we've brought into the fold. We're real excited about giving them some money and seeing uh, how they can help uh, kids get in into the outdoors. And then lastly, before I start our introductions here uh, to Captain Sally, uh, here's some hunts that Larry has put together. Larry Navar, our uh, chief hunt master, he wasn't able to be on today. He's traveling back from a duck hunt in Salt Lake City area, Utah area. But if you wanna do some Sandhill crane hunting, uh, there you go. Uh, in the Port Lavaca area, ducks with top flight outdoors in Columbus. We've got uh, Olton pheasant hunt on December 5th and 6th, uh, ducks and geese in the panhandle, duck hunt uh, in East Texas uh, a couple times there. And uh, Larry is always going duck hunting. He's a wing shooter um, expert, and so he's always hunting there. And so uh, if you want to reach out to Larry, he warmly welcomes you to um, join him for some hunts there. So back here, I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit more about the club here before I uh, get into um, Captain's, introducing Captain Sally. But we're a, a social club, Austin Woods and Waters Club. We have membership from 150 to 250 people per year. It's down towards 150 this year because we haven't been able to meet in person, obviously due to coronavirus. And so um, if you'd like to join our club, if you're on Facebook, there's a join now. If you want to go back to our website, austinwoodsandwaters.org, uh, you can certainly get a membership. They're only 75 bucks. You join now, that'll take you through 2021. And so uh, hopefully uh, we get this coronavirus deal uh, fixed up sooner than later, maybe back in the spring, in the coming this coming spring, we'll get get together and, and meet in person again. But, you know, for the next few months, we're going to be uh, uh, online here and um, uh, doing our virtual luncheons uh, here with all our great uh, uh, guest speakers lined up. So, um with that said, I've hit all my topics here. Uh, Jimmy, let's go ahead and bring uh, Captain Sally into our, our view, viewing screen here. Jimmy Kane is our director today. Jimmy was a club president back in 2017, and he's uh, uh, pulling all, twisting all the wires and uh, making this thing happen for us. So thank you, Jimmy, for, for helping out in that regard. So uh, today we are very blessed to have um, Captain uh, Sally Black. She owns the Baffin Bay Rod and Gun Club. Uh, I guess not club, just Rod and Gun Lodge is probably the more uh, apt way to say that. And so uh, Sally's been on the um, uh, central and, and middle and, and lower coast for a number of years. And I first met her, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, I hosted a panel at some sort of fishing show uh, in Austin uh, that she was on and I moderated that panel and watched her through Facebook through the years and, and pleased to have her back on here. She's moved down into to what I call my home waters, Baffin Bay. That's the uh, holy land for speckled trout fishing. Uh, so um, we've had a number of state record uh, fish being caught out of there and currently the state records in the lower lagoon. I don't want to rob too much of your speech, but it's if you want to catch a trophy trout, you go to Baffin Bay. So uh, Captain Sally is, you know, one of the top uh, experts in the in the state on fly fishing on the coast. And so if she's not the top, it's in the top two or three. That's all, of course, very subjective on there. But she could certainly be in the top two or three fly fishing guides on the Texas coast. So. With that said, thank you for joining us today, Captain Sally. She's in her backyard. It's 80 degrees down there in Rivera Beach, and uh, she's here to tell us about Baffin Bay and uh, fishing and, and, and hunting, for that matter, out of Baffin Bay. Welcome, Captain Sally. Thank you so much. I appreciate it a lot. I'm, a, I'm the one that's blessed to be giving this presentation to you and your club. Thank you for having me back. I've been 
uh, I probably have done a couple of presentations to y'all um, back in the day. And I've been a fishing guide and a hunting guide since 1998. And I started in Rockport. And that's probably how a lot of y'all uh, got to know me early, in, early on in my career as a fly fishing guide. I pulled a boat down there for a long, long time. And then I uh, saw the writing on the wall. It was getting kind of crowded down there. And I made my way down to Baffin Bay and, and met and married the love of my life. And, and he and I, Aubrey Black, um, created this beautiful place called Baffin Bay Rotting Gun. And all of us down here are 100% focused and addicted on trophy trout. And my talk today is going to be about um, our, pers our pursuit of the record and why this place is so perfect for the next state record to come out of. So I've got a little presentation here. I'll get started with that if that's all right with y'all. That's uh, me proudly holding a beautiful 30 incher. And a lot of people talk about uh, trophy trout and what is, what is a trophy trout? What does that mean? And in most bay systems, it's, it's 28 inches and above, but in Baffin Bay, 30 is the new 28. So all of our rods have 30 inch marks and 32 inch marks because uh, that's, that's a pretty standard fish down here on Baffin Bay. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the history and the reasons why Baffin Bay produces all these gigantic trout. So here is the current holder of this Texas state record. Now, there's a little debate here because Bud Rowland, who is a friend of mine, and I know him uh, personally, and I know he caught this fish. However, he was in pursuit of an IGFA world rec record, which means he's got a certified boga grip, and he has two witnesses to this catch. And then he released the fish. But in the great state of Texas, the rule is that you must bring the fish to a certified way station to have it certified as a Texas state record, which Bud did not do. However, the plot thickens. And so he, his friends lobbied the state to make an exception to the rules and allow this fish to be considered the new Texas state record. And it's one heck of a fish, let me tell you. But, um, there will probably be a little conflict if somebody catches a fish uh, slightly bigger than Jim Wallace's fish uh, from 1994, which I'm fixing to show you. And uh, because of the way that the rules were, were stretched, let's say. So here's how it all got started on Baffin Bay. A man by the name, a dapper gentleman by the name of Mike Blackwood brought in this 13 pound nine ounce trout and it was certified as the probably one of the first texas state records and this is the lure that he caught it on um i can't remember what it's called but it's a pretty standard little lure and um this was in 1975 i believe and it was such an important deal mike blackwood wore a suit <laughs> for the picture. Now, this is one of the most dapper fishing pictures I've ever seen. And then this, this is uh, my friend, Jim Wallace. Uh, he's no longer with us, but this is the record in Baffin Bay that everybody is chasing. 13 pounds, 11 ounces. And he did bring this fish into a, a certified way station. And um, this was a long time ago. I mean, the, we call it the cast heard around the world because one of his buddies, um, Paul Brown, came up with this lure called, and he called it a corky. And he gave a bunch of these corkies to Jim Wallace and his buddies, and they went out fishing that day. And I heard the story directly from Jim Wallace's mouth, how he and his friends were fishing, and they were fishing at night in February, and it was really cold. And they were running behind the tide gauge bar, and he showed me exactly where he caught this fish. And it wasn't just this fish. They caught 10 of fish, 10 fish each, a lot like this fish. And it was just a big school of giant trout 
hanging out in shallow water behind the tide gauge bar on a cold February night. But he caught it on the corky. And now everybody knows that the corgi is just uh, world famous for trophy trout fishing. I personally don't use a lot of corkies. I don't know. I don't know why. I've just never been a corky fisherman. Um, you know, the old rule on the corky fishing in the wintertime is that a dead man can't work a corky too slow. So maybe that's why um, I'm not a big corky fisherman. I don't have that kind of patience. But People that like to throw corkies are very, very successful in catching big trout on Bath and Bay. So honestly, this is the record that everybody is chasing. And I hope it's me or someone here at the lodge or one of our guides and, or one of our clients because, you know, we'll have a little publicity on that and it'll be a lot of fun. I guarantee you. So it's been a long time since Bud Rowland caught that fish. And uh, he calls it the big lady. He caught it on a fly, sight casting, down in the lower Laguna Madre. And uh, it's time to break that record. And, you know, Baffin Bay is so unique. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why Baffin Bay is the system most capable of producing this new state record. And you can see on this slide that Baffin is really unique in many, many, many ways. And, it runs east and west versus the rest of the base systems in uh, Texas that generally, generally run north and south. So this bay goes right into the land. And as you can see, there are no lakes or rivers or any freshwater feeding this system. The closest Gulf inlet would be Corpus Christi, which is about um, an hour and 45 minutes away from the north. And the other closest Gulf Inlet would be uh, Port Mansfield, which is a couple of hours to the south. So tide doesn't make it to Baffin Bay. So this is a landlocked hypersaline lagoon with no tide. And, you, and then you think to yourself, what? How do I fish it? And when I moved here from Rockport, that's exactly what I thought. I was like, okay, I'm a tidal fisherman. I follow the tide all day long, sight casting the redfish. So now I come to Baffin, trophy trout capital of the world, no tide. So I really had to give it some in-depth thought and it took a little while, but Baffin is so unique. And the reason the trout get so big here is because there is no tide, because things don't change a lot, because there's no fresh water coming in. And because of that, the fish don't move a whole lot. They certainly don't leave Baffin Bay. So they eat, grow and procreate all in this one spot. And even though it's hypersaline, the, the species of trout here have, have simply adapted to a high saline level. Baffin Bay is such a treasure because it is protected by the King Ranch on the north and the Kennedy Ranch on the south no condos, no boat ramps, no power lines. Okay, the Kennedy does have some oh, stupid old windmills, but overall it is so uh, encased by um, territory that probably looks a lot like it did 500 years ago, which is so cool. It's just so, such a treasure to be there in that kind of an atmosphere. So there's a lot uh, less people here and, you know, on most days you can uh, go around and m maybe see two boats, maybe, or five boats on a Saturday. And um, that's really one of the things that I love the most about this bay. There's one little strip of humanity uh, on the back of the bay. And our lodge is on the Cayo de Grullo, which is the little, um, I'll go back if I can, if I can figure out how to go back to the map. Right here. So our lodge is in the Cayo de Grullo, which is the northern little strip of humanity. And uh, there's the other little one is called the Laguna Salada. And you can see that's where the little houses are and farms and such. And everything else is completely uh, uncivilized, so to speak, non-civilized. So lack of fishing pressure. Everybody knows about the rocks and bath and they're generally made uh, by the casings of circular worms and you're like 
a what? Circular what? So all of the rocks in Baffin are generally made by the casings of a circular worm. So they're not really rocks. It's more like a coral reef. And they're in the middle of the bay. There's huge formations. They're, they're shallow. They're deep. They're long, big, long stretches. There's piles in the middle of the bay that you can actually wade fish on. So um, it's so unique because I, I don't think there's any other place, uh, maybe someplace in Russia, I think, has this, these circulate worms. But anyway, and then along the mouth of Baffin Bay, there's another type of rock, and it's, it's a um, coquina sedimentary rock. And it's an, it's an ancient Gulf beach. And those rocks, which you can see on this picture, are gigantic. And this is, this is some of that ancient Gulf beach. And uh, some of the spoil islands on the intercoastal out there at the mouth, you can find fossilized sand dollars, uh, fossilized of uh, sea anemone. It's very cool. So that's the rocks kind of are scary. I've lost a couple lower units. And I know every it's the old saying on Baffin Bay is it's not, it's not if you're going to lose a lower unit, it's when you're going to lo lose a lower unit. So those rocks, it's for real. And, uh, but once you kind of know where they're at and have it marked on your GPS, it, it gives you a little bit more security, not, not total because there's uncharted rocks all over the place. Um, and we already talked about the King and the Kennedy ranch just enveloping this, this bay system. And then the constant level of salinity is, um, a reason that the fish like to stay here. They've adapted to it and they don't leave which is a real unique thing. Like it, it doesn't um, uh, change much. It, it's very, very stable. And so the fish don't need, and we'll talk about this in a minute, but the fish don't need to move around a lot to find their optimum uh, metabolism area. And Baffin Bay is a great place because it, it has already produced two of the last three um, uh, state records. So, uh, we have a good friendship with some of the people uh, uh, that, that do the uh, biological surveys here on Baffin. And we've learned a lot about the reason that Baffin Bay is so cool. And uh, here's a little article by Shannon Tompkins, who writes for the Houston Chronicle. And he just talks about, you know, the fact that the place is, is so unique and that it has no water flow. And speckled trout... Uh, have adapted to this. And as a matter of fact, I talk, they do a lot of uh, tagging in Corpus at the Heart Institute. And I talked to the man that runs that, um, uh, Greg Stuns. And he's, I asked him, I said, you know those big trout tournaments where they have a live release? So those guys, the guys come down here and they catch the trophy trout on Baffin and then they go to Corpus for the live weigh-in. And then after the live weigh-in, they just release those fish uh, back into the bay in Corpus, which is maybe 35 parts per, per thousand salinity and, and Baffin Bay is maybe 55. So it's a different uh, salinity. And I asked him, what happens to those fish? He said, Sally, they swim back to Baffin. So that is, that, that is one of the coolest things that these fish have adapted to, to this area so hard that they seek it. And then uh, Faye Grubbs is the, the lady from Parks and Wildlife that I would call her the, um, one of the very top experts on Baffin Bay. And I speak with her quite frequently. And so she's, you know, one of her things is that it's a very exaggerated system. Everything grows bigger here. The redfish grow bigger, the, the, the trout of course grow bigger. You'll find 30 inch mullet in this bay. And it, there's more mullet here than you can, I mean, you can walk across the bay on mullet sometimes. And that mullet is the main food source here on Baffin. So there, every once in a while, there might be shrimp here. Every once in a while, uh, croaker fishing is effective here. But generally, th these, all of these fish eat mullet. So in her words, homeostasis is the word that she uses. So homeostasis means... A fish doesn't have to keep moving around to seek its optimum place to live. So let's say a fish in Rockport, uh, the tide comes in 
the fish is acclimated to a certain salinity. The tide comes in, less salinity, the fish moves, expends a lot of energy moving. The tide goes out, more salty water comes out of the back bays into the main bay where the fish is. The fish has to move. So as you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, these fish and other bay systems have to move back and forth and keep on moving. Whereas nothing ever changes here on Baffin Bay. The conditions generally stay the same. So the fish just get lazy, eat, grow, and procreate. That, that's the one and only reason that, and plus the gigantic amount of food that's here uh, is the reason that fish get bigger here. And even redfish don't leave here. So in other bay systems, redfish come and go. Uh, when they get to be 27, 28, 29, 31 inches, they gather up in September and I'm sure a lot of you guys have participated in redfish rodeos in Rockport or uh, Port Mansfield or Port O'Connor. And these fish gather up and they go offshore and they don't come back. So they, they stay offshore and they get huge and they, uh, that's where they do all their spawning and their babies come back into the system. But in Baffin Bay, those fish don't leave. So we've got these huge herds of these 50, 60 inch redfish that actually don't go offshore and live out the rest of their lives. They actually stay in Baffin Bay and it's so unique. So you, it's easy to catch 55, 60 inch redfish and sometimes even sight cast to them uh, in shallow water with half their bodies out, out of the water, even on the fly. So, you know, what, when's the best time really to, to target a trophy trout? Well, when they're fattening up for the spawn. That's one time. And the spawn happens in the spring when the water temperature rises to 75 or 80 and stays there. So between now and maybe early June, the fish are doing two things. One, they're eating up for the winter to survive. Once they survive the winter and the water temperature starts to rise, they get the signal from mother nature that they need to start eating up for their spawn. So they need to gain, gain a lot of body fat to eat up to be able to spawn. Trout don't have muscles to expel their eggs. They kind of beat themselves on the bottom to expel their eggs. So they've got to have a lot of energy. So as the winter goes on and then the water temperature starts to rise in the spring, another big giant feeding happens. So as that goes, the fish just keep getting bigger and bigger and fatter and heavier. And so right before the spawn is the optimum time to catch the heaviest trophy trout. Although in the all winter long, you can catch a big heavy fish. We caught eight and nine pound trout all summer long this year. So it can be done any time of the year, but the optimum heaviest fish will be right before the spawn. When the water temperatures and uh, water temperatures on Baffin tell the fish a lot of things. Like right now, water temperatures dropping means winter is coming. So after their lazy, fat, do nothing summer where mother nature told them nothing, now the water temperature is dropping and they're getting the signal that they need to start eating to survive the winter. And, uh, and then the moon phases, you know, Baffin doesn't have a tide. So now what do you do? Well, we use the so lunar table a lot. Um, moon phases and feeding periods. Uh, the, do, the new moon is much more productive for bigger fish feeding during the day than the full moon. Um, the so lunar feeding periods, the majors and the minors, which you know, I'm not a scientist, but I've sort of gotten into it um, because it really matters. So you can go to a, a, I have an app called Isolunar and it tells me when the moon is directly above my head or directly below my feet, that's a major feeding period. Major meaning that it lasts longer. If the, the moon is on either horizon, that's a minor feed, feeding period, uh, which means it, it might last an hour and a half versus a two and a half hour uh, major. So these four times of the day, and I think it works with deer or any other animal, um, are really a, a key to those fish to begin to feed. And 
if you're paying attention to all of these things, you don't want to be running around the bay. I call it prospecting during majors or minors. So you want to be places where you know the fish are. Another key is finding the con biggest concentrations of bait in the system. So especially in the winter, this is so, so important. You have to have bait in, your, in the area that you're, when I say bait, I'm talking um, mullet. If you are fishing in an area and there are no mullet at all, nothing moving, I would suggest you keep looking. In the winter time, one mullet jumping tells you everything you need to know. When the water is cold, nothing really wants to jump. So mullet jumping might signify a predator is about. So that would be a key for you to cast your lure in that area. Um, not just once, but a lot, because things move a little slower in the winter. So colder water means moving slower, moving your lure, your lure presentation is slower. This is an in-depth talk, so I hope you're following along and I hope that there's some questions I can answer. So where, where to, I'm, this is a little video, but I wanna talk about where to find a trophy in the winter, which we are going into the winter right now. So the concentrations of bait, number one, uh, most big fish are in waist deep to knee deep water, believe that or not. Um, so you're looking for shallower water concentrations of bait fish. And when you find that, that would be a key. Also, you wanna look for places that have a little bit of topography, maybe an area that's got some deep water, maybe some rocks, shallow grass, sand, and a drop off, which would give fish all of the uh, areas that they might uh, be comfortable with during that period of time. So if the water's a little colder, they might be hanging off the edge. If the water's a little colder, they might be in the deeper rocks. Um, if the sun is shining, they might be up on the sand or grass. Uh, all of these things are just, um, as time goes by, you kind of learn to read the water. I call it reading the water. Um, Mother Nature and fish will give you a lot of tips on what to do, and especially mullet jumping. And I don't know how many of y'all have uh, caught a 10 pound trout, but this is a little video in, uh, of a 10 pound trout being caught. and a kind of a funny landing method. I'm gonna go ahead and play it right now. I'm hoping that you can see that. All right, here he comes, coming to hand. Oh no, it's getting kind of hairy. Oh, it's not hooked very well, as you can see. My friend Darren kind of loses his cool and drops his boga grip and re reaches down and gives the 10 pounder a bear hug because this is the biggest fish he's ever caught in his life and gives it a big old kiss. And uh, this is not how I recommend landing a giant trout. You wanna handle them as less as possible. Uh, we use boga grips. We, I don't use a net, um, a lot of people do and I, that's okay. But these big fish have a big protective kind of slimy coating that is real important to keep on them. And keep, try not to keep them out of the water for super extended period, periods of time. Although you gotta get a good fish picture because if you don't have a picture, it didn't happen. So here's my bud, Darren, with a, it was a 32 inch fish and it was 10 pounds. And um, the, I heard him tell the, this story the other day, we were doing a podcast with uh, Cable Smith, Lone Star Outdoor Show. And he was telling Cable about this fish and he said it was 33 inches long. So it's grown an inch since Darren caught that fish. And that's okay. You can, uh, when I get a kiss for helping him get that fish together. Anyway, I hope you got a kick out of that little video. I, I love watching it. And uh, I love hearing that story over and over and over. Every time I, I'm with Darren, I hear that story. And uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, what do you need? Like, what kind of lures do you need? Everybody loves to catch big fish on top water, but sometimes that's not happening. You know, if you don't see action on top, um, it's you, everybody wants to start out with the top water. I'm a little bit more of a plastics person. I want to um, 
find out if the fish are there right off the bat. And so I probably am going to use a paddle tail. Uh, sometimes I use straight tail lures. Uh, when, when it's a little colder, I like to use bigger bodied paddle tails, like the paddle tails on the left. Um, they're called die They're made by saltwater assassin and they're called die dappers. They're five inch kind of heavy bodied, um, paddle tails. And what I like about them is they act a lot like a corky. I use, um, I'm going to show something to y'all. I use these hooks, Black's Magic, our own hooks, of course. Um, they're one thirty-second of an ounce, and they're on number one hooks, and they have a screw lock. And what makes these lures uh, hooks so great, and you can see they're pretty small, and <clears throat> whatever kind of lure you're, you're using, like here's a, here's a paddle tail on a one thirty-second with the number one hook. Uh, you might want to use something bigger like this, like a, a flapping shad. Or uh, this is a, um, a willow tail by Kelly Wigglers. That's also another great lure with lots of action. Uh, one of the real benefits of using this smaller hook, besides a more natural presentation, a lighter lure is a much uh, natural, much more natural presentation because you use a, an eighth ounce or a number three hook, which is what most people use. So this is a number one hook. A number three hook would probably come out about, I don't know, a half an inch farther down the body of this lure. So then all you've got is this part of the lure working versus this part of the lure working. So you see, if you have a shorter shanked hook, your lure has much more action just imagine that. I wish I would have had a bigger hook. I just don't use them anymore, so I don't have one. Uh, so that's another benefit of using a shorter shanked hook, uh, especially if you're going to use it on a on a willow tail. Watch, watch where it comes out on this lure, and I'm going to screw it on because that really makes it better. So look at, look at all the, the lure action you have here versus a number three hook, which would come out about right here and only give you this much action versus this. Big difference. And uh, so those bigger body lures, you can use um, with this hook or any shorter shanked hook or a 132nd, if you can find it, um, will always give you a more natural presentation. Nothing in, in the uh, universe over there drops like a rock. So if you're using one of these light hooks, uh, what I do is I cast it out, and then as soon, as soon as that lure hits the water, I raise my rod tip ever so slightly, and it makes my lure drop like this versus like this. So I get a lot of strikes on that first drop. All those big fish like to hit on the drop. So I'll use that rod tip and that light hook and that light presentation with that heavier body paddle tail and keep it low and slow and low and slow is where those great big mamas hang out. They, they're like a big dog versus a little dog. Little dogs run around all the time. You throw the ball, they'll go get it. They'll chase it. A big dog will lay there. And when the ball gets close, the big dog will go get it. So these big, big fish don't expend a lot of unnecessary energy. So if you're uh, making a presentation low and slow, lifting your lure, making that paddle, uh, Give a vibration, brr, let it drop nice and slow. Lift it, let it drop, lift it, let it drop. Like your, your lure is swimming along the bottom and uh, you will entice big fish to strike. A lot of people don't fish slow enough. Like in a lot of other bay systems, Port Bansfield, Rockport, Port O'Connor, you're fishing a lot of big grass flats and you're moving real fast and you're moving your lure fast because there's a lot of shrimp there. And that's a main target of those fish down in those grass flats is shrimp. Well, here, the main target of these great big trout are mullet. And they eat, trout can eat two thirds their body length. So that great big old paddle tail or that big porky, that's just a snack to those big girls. Um, but they don't want to expend a lot of energy. So you kind of got to get it close to them and working it low and slow is just a secret of the game.
um, you know, also you need the right stuff like rod, line, and gear. I, everybody talks to me about rods, line, and gear. Um, I use the lightest products on the market. I use a Sarge custom rod uh, built just for me. It's called the Priest. I think you should name, rename it the Priestess. But anyway, it's a 6'6", six, six, medium light, super light rod. Captain Sally, I'm going to step in here. We've got a few questions that have come up okay. over the last little bit. Um, first and foremost, my question is, where do you buy a Black's Magic Lead Head? Okay, uh, you can buy it online at, on our website, Bath and Bay Rod and Gun. There's a shop there. You can buy it. Uh, okay. Also, it's at Roy's Bait and Tackle. And Roy's what, Bait and what Tackle. Is, what is in that Roy's? Chris is there is any is there something that's not at Roy's? <laughs> it's a hundred dollar bill every time you walk in there. I don't care who you are. <laughs> and uh, yes. <laughs> so and, uh, uh, you can also get it at Tackle Town in Rockport. Tackle Town. Place in the valley that you. Can get. Mm -hmm. oh. Awesome. So you're talking about the baits come up and down. Do you ever incorporate uh, Mansfield Mauler into your arsenal of tackle to help that action of going up and down? Well, you know what? That really works well with um, beginner fishermen, particularly. Uh, we use Cajun Thunder popping corks. And I'll put the um, Gulp Swimming Mullet, four inch swimming mullet, on that Black's Magic hook and maybe give it about an 18 inch uh, drop leader. And so for beginners that aren't really um, comfortable, let's say with certain presentations, that's a great way to start. And that pop and cork is magic. So okay. yeah, absolutely. And then lastly, before I let, let you get back to, to your presentation, Kevin McConnell wants to know, Unrelated to what you've said so so far uh, to date, but uh, how did Hurricane Hannah affect Baffin Bay uh, other than wiping out a, a few dozen derelict floaters? <laughs> All right. Well, um, it it did. It, it was about a twelve-hour cleanup in my in my yard, and I lost some landscaping. But uh, no, it was it was about a hundred miles an hour for about four hours. And um, the main brunt of the dam was down in the land. So there's a lot of wiped out cabins down there. <laughs> and uh, but here it was just a bunch of docks. Um, but no, it was it was just a it was just a standard blow. So it, it didn't affect any, any, at all. any change to the water itself, any new sandbars. Um, no, holes. Just was, no, it wasn't that strong. So what happened here was it. It blew all day long from the west, which is, you know, a, di a, a direction across the land, basically. And it was about 50 to 80 miles an hour most of the day. And then when that storm came in a little south of us, the wind switched to the east. And that's what did all the damage to all the docks on the bay. But that was about it. We had a little surge from the wind. and um, But the main core of the damage was south of here. So no... Yeah. Uh, but Baffin Bay does change all the time. There, sand moves around. Um, I've seen a lot of change on Baffin in the last couple of years. But the water is beautiful, and we've got lots and lots of grass. Good. Okay. Thank you. I'll let and, you get back to your presentation. And I was just kind of talking about rods and line and in reels. I'm using the. Um, um, hold on. I just I just picked it up. Uh, the lose custom light. <clears throat> if you want to throw a rod and reel that is super light, I and mean, I throw, I cast so many. I want the lightest products on the market that can withstand the salt water of Baffin. So this lose custom light is a dream come true. I want to tell you, and I don't think it's very expensive. And I have used mono, actually some kind of a polymer line. I use suffix. Um, which is a polymer line of sorts. It's not mono. It's pretty limp. It, it ha doesn't have a lot of memory. But recently, I got talked into putting braid on this um, loose custom light. And 
So I'm, there is a learning curve because I'm used to the stretch and I haven't used braid in a long, I, I think the last time I used braid was in 2005. So um, I'm trying braid and there is a little bit of a learning curve because there is no stretch, but uh, it's been fun. It's been a fun project. I'm not totally sold, but anyway, the keeping it light, keeping it simple, not too much stuff. Um, you know, take colors with you, dark and light. So purple and chartreuse has been just magic. Um, anything lighter than that, you know, keep a couple of, uh, you know, jig heads in your pocket, some light lures, some dark lures, uh, maybe a top water like a skitter walk or a one knocker spook. Um, I use an over the shoulder box built by Feral Concepts. You might look into them. That's really simple. Easy, and I hook all my stuff onto it. So I've got my stringer hooked onto it. I've got my boga grip hooked onto it. I use um, some real easy uh, fly use uh, cutters and I have that hooked to my shirt. So I'm running real light. Everything I'm doing is really super light. I have very comfortable boots on and um, I, I wear the right clothes and I don't want to be cold. So I invest in expensive gear. And the thing about expensive gear, gr granted, there's upfront cost, but you that stuff lasts a long time and you're gonna stay dry and you'll be able to layer up and you won't be cold. So part of taking all of that out of the picture, it lets you focus more on your target, which is catching a trophy trout. So I don't wanna be thinking about being cold. I don't wanna be thinking if I forgot something. I don't wanna be thinking about my bad reel that's not working right. I want to keep all of my focus on reading the water, being in the right place, reading the water, making the correct presentation to where I know trophy fish are hanging out. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, time on the water, you know, that goes without saying. I've been a guide for, um, this is going to be my 23rd year. So I have a lot in my uh, memory bank about fishing and that helps a lot. So when you do it a lot, you know, you're always prepared for whatever happens. When you only do it once a month, it makes it kind of tough. So that's where um, listening to your fishing or uh, your buddies that fish a lot comes in handy. Um, after getting ready for trophy trout, um, I'm a big hunter. I don't know if y'all know that or not. But uh, I love dove hunting and I love duck hunting. I love spending all day long with my good dog, Cinder. And uh, she's three years old this year, professionally trained. And she's just a hoot and a half to be with. And uh, we're getting ready for duck season this weekend, is opening weekend for us. And I'll be out Sunday. And, uh, my dog is just prepped and ready to go because we had a fantastic dove hunting season here. Um, we still have tons of dove, and I know the split is going to be fabulous. So you can put two and two together. You can, the uh, dove season and the duck season overlap. So one of my favorite things to do, duck hunt in the morning, dove hunt in the afternoon, a blast and nest. So if you want to do something like that, give me a call. Um, a great place to stay here down at the lodge. We have great food. We have a great staff. All of our guides are fun and funny. And we, we're all teaching guides. And um, we really, really, really love to host uh, families, beginners, and hardcore guys and girls. I know a lot of hardcore girls. Don't, I, I didn't mean to be um, uh, taking them out of the picture. I just, um, I've been doing it for so long. I call everybody a guide. But anyway, um, you know, if you want to come down and learn about targeting trophy trout, uh, from now till the early part of June, um, come on the new moon, uh, work with me on the moon phases, uh, start looking at stuff like that. Um, you want to be about three days past a big front, you know, that pre front fishing is a dream come true. So having time, time, everything like that, sometimes it's really difficult and you can't get away. Sometimes we have opening. Um, you can call and say, Hey, what's it like down there? Can I come in a couple of days? What do you think? And if we can fit you in, we surely will. We sleep 20 people here at the lodge, and um, it's a real comfortable atmosphere. It's like home. And we made it to be easy going. We have a full bar. We have a beer on tap all the time. Like I said, we have great staff. 
we all have new boats and uh, all of our guides here have lots and lots of experience. So whether you like to duck hunt and fish, that would be called the blast and cast. Uh, you could do a cast and ca cast and blast, duck, uh, fish and dove hunt, or a blast, duck hunt and dove hunt. So there's a million things to do down here. And once everybody comes here, they never want to leave. And I, I, I feel the same way. I love this place. Bath Bay is a real treasure that you should um, definitely experience. It's not very far away from San Antonio in Austin either. So um, come on down and, and chill out on Bath and Bay. And by the way, we're a COVID free zone. Just want to let you know. <laughs> the only well, COVID, COVID free Sally. zone I know. Excellent presentation. Love seeing all your pictures, videos, all that. That was fantastic. We have one more question that has come up. Uh, Charles R. wants to know, how will the trout like the noise from the Boca Chica spaceport? Oh, that's pretty far south. That's pretty far south from here. Um, that, that would be a couple hours, maybe, or three. Yep. South it's of probably that. 100 miles, yeah. Long way. Yeah. So the people that fish South Bay, Port Isabel, um, down there, that's part of their program. And I like to fish down there. I like to go snook fishing with Ernest Cisneros. And, uh, he's awesome. He, uh, he's an awesome dude. I'm going to fish with him this week, this coming week. So he and I fish for yep. fun together. In the, he's a, you got to like to uh, wade fish in the mud, though, to catch a snook. I'm just telling you. Yeah, I don't know I mean, if I can do it anymore. As, as an almost 60-year-old man, I, I did it about 15 years ago with him and, and kept up, and we caught some decent snook, and that was a heck of a trip, very memorable, that's for sure. So, yeah, well, I caught um, my first snook with him um, this past summer, 28. Nice. Very yeah, nice. Cool. nice. It was very cool. Okay, and wrapping up here, I, I remember 15 years ago when I – when I um, moderated this panel and, and Captain Sally was on it, she had something. I had just gotten married. This was in 2005. I had just gotten married and, and my wife was out in the audience. And uh, Sally had a saying that's really stuck in our family ever since then for the last 15 years. And uh, her, her, her saying or, or motto or whatever was families that fish together stay together. And we've kept that in mind and utilized that uh, throughout our uh, marriage. And as my daughters come in and, into our lives. And, and so it's a quite a, a, a saying, I'm glad you offered that to us. And, and uh, we continue to say that and it definitely works, no doubt about it. So uh, a few other announcements here and stuff uh, before we sign off, but um, the uh, Marianne has texted me and wants recipes. So she's continuing to build her recipe portion of our website. So if you've got your favorite, uh, whether it be venison, whether it be uh, trout uh, uh, recipe, I, I need to submit my hot and crunchy trout uh, to there. I plagiarized as most good cooks do from uh, the old Hudson's on the Bend uh, restaurant and do a hot and crunchy trout. And uh, so anyway, send your recipes in to Marianne at the website uh, uh, there so she can continue to build that and offer that as a um benefit to our to our membership. Uh, there was an event uh, this past weekend, uh, last Saturday, called Flies and Flames, and, and that's about fly fishing. And uh, Jimmy, why don't you bring Sally back in real quick, please? Um, it was uh, up here in V Cave, Texas, just on the west side of Austin. If you haven't heard about that, Sally, it's a fantastic event. Uh, Scott McGuire and Trey Reb, who are members of our club, are the promoters of that event. And it's all about uh, getting the fly fishing community of, of Austin, whether it be fresh or saltwater, to get together and um, uh, have a day. And, and the flames, of course, is barbecue. So there's got some fantastic barbecue and, and wonderful beer, the aircraft beer. And Woods and Waters had a table there. Matter of fact, we gave away a membership. We had about 50 people stop by our, our, our table. And uh, Wyatt Simmons got the free membership. Wyatt, uh, if you're listening, we'll uh, reach out to you and get you your membership. But anyway, Sally, uh, I'll cook you and Scott McGuire and Trey Webb up. It's uh, an event that they produce and they do a really cool job. It's a fantastic environment and, and thing and something I high, highly recommend. You you will like uh, being a part of that. I'd love that. 
Yep. I'll give you an introduction and send you some Facebook links and all that kind of good stuff there. That's great. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. And then one more uh, thing I've got is um, uh, board members. One more time, I'd like to see if anybody out there in TV land wants to be a board member here at Austin Woods and Waters. Uh, we would love to visit with you and uh, get you involved. Uh, again, it's been a rewarding experience for, uh, for me and, and really for most of anybody who's been there uh, on our board. So uh, with that said, uh, thank you so much, Captain Sally, for your time today and your fantastic presentation. I could talk to you for another 30, 40 minutes, an hour. We could break out, you know, the ranch water or whatever, but I've got a one thirty meeting with an attorney and uh, we have to talk about a contract. So uh, that produces the income that uh, makes all this fishing fun go, go um, as it does. So uh, again, thank you all for joining us today. If you want to get a membership to the Austin Woods and Waters Club uh, and you're on Facebook, uh, click on the Facebook. Um, uh, there's a join now button on Facebook on there. And if you're on YouTube, uh, just simply go to austinwoodsandwaters.org and uh, sign up for uh, a membership to our club. Thanks for joining us here in November. And then Jimmy, if you come in on December, our guest speaker is, I think you're on mute, Jimmy. I think we're gonna get, try and get the book guys back. So Dave, uh, is it Dave Ryan? I got to call him today, in fact. Okay. Well, another top quality program lined up for December. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, these videos will be posted on our YouTube and Facebook pages. Thanks again, Captain Sally. Y'all have a good day and uh, best.